So uh, first of all, everybody, welcome to this amazing, wonderful opportunity and event. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ria Renouf. I'm actually a uh, news anchor with News 1130 Radio in Vancouver, and it is my honor and privilege to be able to uh, play a small role in this graphic novel reading event. Uh, we have PJ Patton here, and uh, we also have Sabrina Simington. Uh, PJ, I know that you're a uh, New West resident, so woot woot. And Sabrina, I know that um, you've also had uh, opportunities to broadcast um, not just in Vancouver, but beyond. Do you, you actually do uh, like weekly sessions, right? Yeah, I've done a few different types of live streaming over the years. Uh, right now, I've got two active shows on uh, Sundays. I stream out uh, the Sunday portrait where I'm talking to interesting people like PJ was on one time, say, and I draw their portrait while we have a conversation. And uh, Tuesdays, I'm also streaming. Um, I call it Dollar Store Kit Bash where I, I make toys and I cut them up and put them together. And in the past, I'd streamed uh, live voice training for transgender women. Uh, just putting out exercises. I haven't done that lately because I'm going to be working on new videos with that. But any kind of live event like this is just a joy to be a part of. I, I don't know what is the magic about live things. It's always, you never know what you're going to get. It's like yeah. a, almost like a roulette wheel, so to speak. So, and PJ, this is also not your first time doing a live stream, obviously. Um, no, 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 it's not. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're all very excited to be here. And uh, just a few things before we get started. Um, I do want to acknowledge that, uh, and, and the Arts Council of New Westminster also wants to acknowledge that as well, that uh, we are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people of the Kikite Nation, as well as the uh, Coast Salish Nation. So, so uh, we, we acknowledge and we appreciate that. Um, all right, so a couple of housekeeping things before we uh, dive right into it. Um, this is absolutely a safe space for everybody and we welcome everybody, but I do want to really stress that we have zero tolerance for any kind of discrimination or harm to others. Um, and that we do ask that you respect the opinions of others. Um, and we do also ask that you don't assume pronouns or gender or uh, knowledge based on somebody's name or video image. So please, please, please be respectful of that. And we also want to make sure that you take the time to respect yourself as well. So if you, you run into a situation where you, you think you need a break, we do ask that you try and be as present as possible. But if you do need to step away, you are more than welcome to. Please feel free to get up and just, if you could just make sure that you mute your mic, um, that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, so there's also a Q and A portion that we will have later on. So we'll be able to uh, collect your questions if you have any. I know I have all kinds of questions for both Sabrina and PJ after reading their amazing work. So I have my own curiosities that I'd like to answer. And this is such an, an amazing opportunity to uh, be able to talk to them about their work and why are they've done this work and published this work. So um, do not be shy. Uh, please make sure you submit your questions in the chat and I will try and uh, make sure that we get to them and, and answer those questions. All right, so let's start off by introducing PJ. Uh, so PJ Patton is an artist, author, and tattooer. You told me earlier before we got started, you were tattooing this morning, right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> I had a client this morning before this. So I started working at nine, like 9.30 this morning. Oh my gosh. To get it, out, to get it finished before, so I have some time to drink some coffee before this started. So yeah. Yeah, so you're a tattooer. You were born in Japan as well, and you were raised in California, which is, I believe, the setting for, for most of Tower 25. Is that correct? It is the setting for the whole book, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And the work pulls from um, your own lived experience with addiction, homelessness, mental health, and the juvenile justice system. And you wrote and illustrated Tower 25, which is incredible, incredible work. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, that's all very true. <laughs> um, now, you're also, aside from the tattooing and the writing, you're also working on adapting a play called The Tashme Project? Yes, I'm currently working on adapting the uh, the screenplay, The Tashme Project, which toured around Canada a couple of years ago, and it's like a verbatim play on the Japanese internment experience in Canada done by Julie Tomiko Manning and Matt Miwa. They went and interviewed 
people that were in the internment camps as children and turn it into a, uh, into a play that traveled around. So we're working on adapting that play into a graphic novel format. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. So the fact you're taking time to speak with us today is just, we really appreciate yeah. it. So um, I suppose uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. I believe you're going to read some pages from your book that you've uh, chosen for us. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I believe that is what's happening. So when I see them come up on the screen, I will do so. There we go. All right. I was always so grateful every time I found a fire still burning. Uh, yeah, when you're homeless and especially it does get cold in Southern California, contrary to people's beliefs. So if there is a fire, this page is probably one of my favorites because it was like the little things, you know, like you find like a fire still burning and it's like, you know, then you're, then I was going to be warm that night. Uh, I didn't have a blanket or anything. I just had a backpack and like three layers of clothing that I always wore. So you can't sleep on the beach, um, but I could at least warm up a little bit before going to lay down for the night. So yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite pages. It was like really positive actually, you know, me, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's just, I love that one. Let's see, what's the next one page? I needed a safe place to sleep and the bathroom was perfect. Um, yeah, so at this beach, the whole name of the book comes from the number of the lifeguard tower, which was in front of the bathroom where I was sleeping. Um, in this era, this is like, I guess, early 2000s, there is two online things on going on called Bum Hunter and Bum Fights. And, bum fights. and so homeless people were being exploited and so it was really hard to find a safe place to sleep. And these bathrooms at the beach were left unlocked and had locks. So yeah, so that's why it worked. It had a, it had a lock on the door. So at least I knew, I mean, it was gross, but at least I knew I was safe and it had a roof so and walls. So there's protection from the elements. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, we can do the next one. Yeah, let's see. Afraid of being caught by the police, I had to make sure no one saw me. One last lick over my shoulder just to be safe. It was small, smelled like piss, but there was a toilet and a door that locked. Yeah, so in California and a lot of places, they've, there's a lot of laws passed that make it basically illegal to be homeless. Um, you can't sleep in public, for instance, and they say there's no sleeping on the beach during the daytime, but that's only directed towards people that look like they're homeless. If a family sleeping on the beach during the daytime, obviously they're not gonna bother them. So, and what would happen is that you would get picked up by the police and then given a fine, the court appearance, taken to jail or just dropped off in the middle of nowhere, right? So trying to hide from the cops was actually kind of my biggest concern with everything. And then, the bathroom itself, it was pretty cramped. Like I used my backpack as a pillow and my backpack went right up against the base of the toilet. And then I had just enough room to stretch out my legs, you know? So yeah, there it is. But I mean, to me, it was like, um, like I said, it was a safe place that was dry and the door locked. So I was actually really grateful for that at least that I had figured it out. Oh, so, let's see the next page. Okay, yeah, so these pages jump around a bit. I just kind of picked a sample. So the truth of my situation sank in, and this is me standing at the bottom of a garbage can, and there's like a syringe in there, an alcohol bottle. But the, the reference is to the fact that, one, I hit bottom, and it's referring to what being homeless wasn't enough for me to hit bottom with my meth addiction. It wasn't until I was digging through the garbage looking for foil to smoke meth on that it kind of sunk in like how low I had gotten. So this this page is referencing that being at the bottom, like digging through the garbage and just kind of like, you know, the truth of my situation finally sank in. I was kind of just at the bottom looking out and yeah. 
it's one of my favorite pages from the whole book art wise i think it's really it has a nice impact to it but yeah we can look at the next one my place to live was gone and that includes a lot of things i took for granted yeah um yeah right like yeah <laughs> a lot i haven't really read this book since i published it or since it was published so when I do these readings, I have to admit, they kind of catch me off guard a little bit when I look at some of the pages. Uh, this one's really loaded, I guess, for me. Just, you know, I went from having a condo by the beach, and before I knew it, I had nothing. And, you know, it's really hard to get on your feet when you don't have a phone. Um, like, you can't grocery shop, you know, because there's no way to store anything. There's no showers, um, there are bed, you know, there's no beds. And so there, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that where I just instantly remembered like, wow, I really took, I, I had it pretty, I had it pretty good. And I just flushed it all uh, to get high basically, or deal whatever my headspace was at the time. But yeah, there it is. Let me look at the next one. Oh yeah, this one too. <laughs> I didn't like myself and I loathed how it felt inside my heart. The first time I got high, drugs plugged the hole in my heart. Um, hey, this one's pretty self-explanatory. The imagery is some of my favorite, once again, from the book. I'll probably say that about multiple pages, but oh, I feel like this one's really clear, right? Like you might do drugs to experiment, but I did drugs with the intention of trying to numb myself out. I was a pretty miserable kid. I'm not sure why or how, but at uh, age 15, I was a full on meth and opiate addict already. So when the first time I did meth, like I felt normal, which is, I guess, you know, it's just how it is. And then the opiates just helped me not feel anything. And then opiates also the rush of not to promote drug use but like the rush of opiates it's kind of feel kind of felt like a hug or like a warm embrace and i don't know how else to explain it other opiate users will understand what i'm talking about but so yeah the the combination of those two so i guess you could say i was speedballing at a at the age of 15 already so yeah and it just it's funny when i look at this the best I ever did in high school was when I was on the most drugs. So that's how I was coping with whatever mental health issues I had going on at the time. So yeah. All right, yeah, we can go to the next one. So yeah, so this jumps to getting arrested for the first time when I was 14. Um, I was questioned, strip searched, checked for lies and asked to turn my head and cough and showered. It was, I was a mess. I couldn't stop crying. When I was given my phone call, I turned it down. What was I going to say to my parents? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so now that's what, that's what it's like when you get arrested as a kid. I never got in trouble as an adult, so I don't have anything to compare it against. But yeah, you know, you go in, you get strip search, check for lice, and yeah, and uh you know, they give you a collect call and I was such a mess. Like I said, like I couldn't stop crying. And so I just turned it down. Like, you know, like what like exactly what it says. Like, I didn't know what I would say to my mom or my dad. And, you know, <laughs> the, the, what I had done involved my parents too. So my dad had actually called the cops on me. So yeah, you know, I wasn't going to call them, basically. I was just like, oh, well, here I am, you know. And that, yeah, that entered, that started my uh, four-year journey in the juvenile justice system. And what I will say about that is once you're in the system, it's really hard to get back out because stuff that you do that normally would just go under the radar for any other kid, like ditching school and stuff like that, will actually get you in trouble legally. So I went back to juvenile hall four times after this. And there was a few of them were drug, dirty drug test related. And one time I got arrested for ditching school. So 
once you're in the system, your life changes when you're a kid. Like you can't do kid things anymore. But yeah. Alrighty, we're gonna look at the next one. Let's see. Yeah, so this is more about my stay in juvenile hall. Um, I went back to my cell and cried. I've never felt so alone as I did those first few days. Yeah, um, first few days were rough. You know, I didn't have any distractions and not really anybody to talk to you. Like I got, you got out of your cell for a little bit every day, but not much. And I'm not one of those people who can sleep all day. So I just laid there awake, stuck alone with my thoughts a lot. And, you know, this pattern, this whole scene would repeat itself when I was homeless. It was very much the same thing. A lot of alone time and just me and my thoughts alone. And yeah, it's not a pretty place to be when you've been numbing yourself up for a long time. All that stuff that I put away came out at once and pretty sure I just cried for like five days straight. You know, one when I first went to, the first time I went to juvenile hall it was pretty ugly for myself. Uh, yeah, we can look at the next one. So, okay, so this is back to being homeless. Um, this is the only picture in the whole book where there's a face, if I'm correct. Um, I was unprepared for winter and got very ill. With no real shelter, things quickly went from bad to worse. So, like I said, it gets cold down there. It gets down to freezing. It's an irrigated desert. So in the winter time at night, you know, it gets to 32 Fahrenheit or colder. Um, and like I said earlier, I didn't have a blanket. So I would get sick. And the last time I got really sick was really bad. And, you know, I didn't have any money. This is the U.S., so there's no health care, right? You don't can't just roll up to a uh, clinic. So, yeah, so this is this puts you to the point, too, if you're homeless or you don't have the means, then you have to start stealing. I mean, you don't have to start, but I've started stealing, like, NyQuil so I could, or DayQuil so I could function, right? Because I had to function. I didn't have any place to lay down, like, it didn't matter how awful I felt. When you're homeless, you just have to keep moving, you know? And I'd never slept in a shelter. And, you know, so sometimes I would like sleep hiding behind dumpsters during the daytime just to avoid the cops. And yeah, and so, and then this picture, like I said, is the only one that has a face. And uh, it was intentional. I was just hoping that by leaving the face blank, people would, um, I don't know, people would be able to see strangers' faces in it, I guess, or someone they knew, or themselves, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, we can look at the next one. Not having a blanket and cold showers in the winter air. So at the beach, they have showers for you to rinse off at, right, after you get all the water. Um, but it's not heated. So I would go out there in my trunks and take showers, you know, when I could in the cold winter air and it sucked for sure. And I think the thing that sucked about it most was taking a shower just to put on like dirty clothes again. So it's just like, I'm really uptight about like personal hygiene now. Like I'm just, you know, like I don't want to smell. I don't want my clothes to smell because it just reminds me of that. And it didn't matter how many times I took a shower if I was lucky to do my time it up with doing my laundry, I'd be pretty psyched and really happy about it. But in general, I just shower to put on like crusty, dirty clothes again. Because if I had a couple bucks, I wasn't going to spend it on laundry. I was probably going to spend it on a cup of noodles so I could eat. So yeah, those those just the decisions you, you have to make when you're in that situation. So PA, you know, public service announcement: be a little bit kinder to homeless people, right? Like you know, if they looking dirty and stuff like that, like clean clothes is the last of their concern, right? You're just trying to survive and have something to eat. So, all right, I don't know, is there a next page or does that, oh, no, that's, we're on the Sabrina, sorry. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, PJ, thank you so much for reading those um, sections for us. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. And I just want to take a moment to remind the audience that there are options to ask uh, PJ and Sabrina questions. So if you do have a question, um, and especially now while it's fresh, um, please make sure that you submit it. And uh, we'd be happy to answer it once um, Sabrina is finished reading as well. So I'm going to turn things over now to Sabrina Simington. And uh, very oh, what? Feel... Oh no! I've seen a breakup. Just as I'm not sure if I'm the one glitching out or Ria is. I don't think it's. I see you loud and clear, Sabrina. Oh no, Ria's the one that got cut oh. out. Oh, oh, are you back? There we go. All right. Yeah. This is the beauty of uh, of. Uh, Zoom, I guess, because I have very unstable internet. So my apologies if I do cut out. Oh, that um, <laughs> um, so Life of, known for her ongoing webcomic series, Life of Bria, and graphic novels first year out and its sequel coming out again. Uh, she is an alumni of Emily Carr University of Art and Design um, and a cancer survivor. Oh no, cut out again. We're playing, Sabrina. That's yeah. It's what I do. I have the curse. You know, I think, I think difficulties. It's a. It's a the sure there, we oh, there we go. There we go. Um, so I'll just read the last line and hopefully uh, she currently lives in Vancouver, where she integrates her art and um, and her work uh, and and tries tries. I love this. You try one new thing every day. It's a good way to live. Yes, absolutely. So um, before I cut out any more, why don't we have you go ahead and, and start reading from, from your pages? Sure. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to read from chapter two of my book, Inspiration. Uh, a little quick forward, I guess. Like the, I wrote this book is a sequel to my uh, first book, First Year Out. And uh, that book was about a trans girl's first year out of the closet. And even in the course of writing it, I realized how much I changed. And I knew that if I wrote like a second year out, that would be a really different book. And as you know, I kind of got into the mindset of thinking about writing such a book, I realized like, yeah, well, the first book was really about me. It wasn't an autobiographical, but it was a lot of myself and people very much like me that I talked to about these trans experiences. And so I thought, oh, I should, you know, there's so many you know, rich diversity in our community of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, you know, all sorts of ways of being in the world, as well as other intersections, uh, such as a person's, uh, you know, whether you're neurotypical or neurodivergent, uh, or if you're a racialized person, person of color, uh, class, uh, all sorts of things that go into a person's background that kind of matter in terms of you know, how we think about ourselves and how we interact with the world. And so I want to represent all of those things and how they intersect with how we change over time. All the parts go into making a person. So chapter two is about, it was leaning more towards the neuroatypical side of things. I was discovering in the course of writing this book, I learned that I had ADD. And uh, I was talking with a lot of people I knew who are transgender, who either were in that ADD, ADHD spectrum or autistic, which those two are very related and realizing how much that affects who we are and how we see ourselves and how it was changing how I saw myself as I learned this about myself. So this chapter is about this kind of integration as well as it's called inspiration because you'll see being who we are in the world kind of flies our flag for everybody else and you can find your people, so to speak, because I've been very privileged to in the course of writing these comics that I do. So we, we open on our characters uh, with dog walking scene. Uh, I had to include an homage to my siblings uh, now departed dog uh, in here in this character of this dog. So I thought it'll oh, start that off walking dog meet lots of people. And we see another character flying out the flags uh, out front of the house. And we can go to the next one. And uh, yeah, well, I recognize the rainbow gay pride flag, huh? And the trans flag, the non-binary flag, and the lesbian feminist pride labrys flag. I don't see that one so often. It's a shame because it's quite badass. But I don't recognize this flag. 
Oh, that's my Audi gender flag. Audi gender. Is that like where, oh, I'm getting cut off. I can't read my own thing because it's showing the bottom of the Zoom meeting. Where'd my stylus go? So maybe I can hide that and actually see it clearly. Or is it going to always be there for me? Well, I know it basically. Is that where one's gender is informed by their experience of autism? Yes, that is exactly what it is. Hey, good dog. Really? That's a thing? Ah. Uh, and a quick note again, like I chose those flags because they seem to align most with the characters that I, as I conceive them being in this house, who are the main focus of the previous chapter. So we, you know, kind of know a little bit about who they are through that. Um, and I made uh, this Audi gender thing, as you'll see, is a very much about once you find out something is a thing for yourself, like, oh, that's a thing you can be, suddenly you can rethink about who you are and it can be profoundly affecting of a person. Yeah, I'm autistic and my experience of my gender is linked to my experience of autism. So I identify as Audi gender. That's amazing. I'm kind of figuring out if I'm on the spectrum right now, but I never thought of how my experience of my gender could be linked to my other experiences such as autism, but it makes complete sense. Wait, did you think, say you think you are autistic? Oh yes, I suspected I was on the spectrum for years and I recently finally found a doctor who took me seriously. I did an assessment last month and according to the specialists, I very likely have high functioning autism spectrum disorder. Ugh, why do they have to use that gross language like high functioning and disorder? Like why is one's degree of functionality should be dictated by how well we function in society? And uh, that's a common line I hear of people talking in general about when we talk about ourselves. It's how our language that we use really matters and how we sort of think about ourselves. And if we shift the language away from more stigmatizing forms, it can allow the people affected by whatever it is we're describing with that language to get a more correct understanding of themselves. It's not full of bias and baggage. And uh, also, I also want to know we have these characters kind of gushing at one another because I find that's how it often goes when you find somebody like yourself. You just start laying it all out and getting very close very quickly. And uh, as you can see in this chapter, that's what'll happen. We can go to the next one. I don't know if I'll get through the whole chapter or not, but I believe how well people function shouldn't be determined by how productive they are within an extremely imposed societal or externally imposed societal structure. Huh, I never thought of it that way. But like I said, I'm kind of new to all this. This is a really cute setup here, though. Are you just moving in? A couple weeks ago. Hey, if you like that, you're going to love this. So I just moved up from the States, and I was really bummed that I had to leave my beloved workshop behind. But I got up here and found, to my delight, that my wonderful and beautiful girlfriends had set aside the space for me to start up a new workshop. And we get the opening garage. I don't know if there's actually that many houses that have a garage like this in Vancouver. I envision this like an East Van uh, apartment if people you know, living maybe in like the ground floor of a house. So, but it's pretty rare to see that kind of garage. I was like, no, I want it. This is my fantasy. I'll let this person have a nice little space and they can <laughs> give their a little private. I kind of dream of like, I've got my own studio and such. I try to set up my space just my own way. And I think I kind of dream of these little, you know, habitats that would be perfect for myself or someone else. And we can see inside on the next page. I already set up my 3D printer. All I could bring was this little basic model though. I'm going to 3D print better parts to make a better printer. I can relate. I found a pegboard and picked up a few tools at the flea market so I could build some deck furniture. I already started up an organic hydroponic herb garden with these old pipes I found, which is fed through the most precious part of it all. Oh my gosh, are there fish in there? So I really wanted to leave the States. The political landscape in the USA is just too scary as a trans person right now. And I was tired of the constant antagonism. I was getting even, it was getting, antagonism I was getting even living in the supposedly liberal Washington state. I also didn't want to leave my precious bed of fish, Giorno, behind, but I knew he wouldn't survive the move with me. Well, I agonized over what to do, Giorno died. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay, he had a good fishy life. Besides, my wonderful girlfriend surprised me soon after I got here with a new fishy friend. Oh, Giorno too. 
And I mean, all of this is like true stuff. Like I know somebody who blew me away when she showed me her 3D printer that she 3D printed out of her old 3D printer. And this model of re or idea of remaking oneself is a recurring theme throughout the story. I did find a pegboard and I bought some tools at the flea market and I've got one finally. But at the time I wrote this, that hadn't happened yet. I just wanted it. And I haven't made a hydroponic garden, but I love the idea of it. And, you know, I've got my habitat back here where there was actually a bed, a bed of fish living in there, but fortunately he passed away a little while ago and I haven't been able to get another one. But I wanted to sort of integrate a lot of these parts of my self into almost like a dream fantasy space. This character isn't me and is very different from me in a lot of ways, but I related to her through this aspect of, yeah, but I know I'm like this. I want all these things in my life. I'm making things. I want to create a little habitat for myself. And how would this person do something similar? It was kind of where I was aiming with this. And uh, it's not Giorno 2, though, I believe we find on the next page. Uh, well, you can tell by the shorter fins that this one is actually a female betta. Though I guess I feel kind of weird applying gender categories to creatures that very likely don't have a concept of gender in the way we humans do. Like, is it necessary that we apply the same categories to fish as we do to ourselves? Is our linking of gender pronouns and social roles and organization to biological categories centered on reproduction that have tremendous variation across species, a fundamentally dehumanizing practice that serves to reinforce the status quo of white, patriarchal, heterosexual, cisgender colonialism? But anyway, it's nice because this kind is usually less territorial than Jorno was. So maybe I can get a little community of fish going on in there. I sense many bright new opportunities for you. And uh, yeah, also that was a long way of saying that her name is Jolene. Uh, and before I move on there, uh, that's a, a Jojo reference. Uh, PJ will know somewhat what I'm talking about, I yep. think. Uh, very popular cartoon these days that I quite love. It has really influenced me over the years. And I think of the betta fish as the, the Jojo of the fish world because it's very flamboyant and beautiful, but it's the men, the males that are typically the more flamboyant and beautiful, just like in this cartoon with these beautiful, muscular, flamboyant men being unabashedly themselves. And I've always liked that. I think that's the reason why I always gravitate to betta fish. And I think all these things like this deep dive, this character getting more and more intense is like, I think that's how I respond to a lot of things and a lot of my friends do. And then we kind of back out and we're like, but yeah, but also like, I don't want to get too up into that. Like we could dissect this, but also at the same time, I just wanted a nice fishy that could live together and you know, it's it, we were kind of deconstructing the world, but at a certain point, we have to back off and turn off our brains from that part of things. It's a uh, it's a weird thing you have to do when you start analyzing yourself and the world like this. And uh, one thing I'm appreciating more is that I also enjoy not making eye contact at times and being around people without that pressure really helps. And I've heard that lots of times from my friends. Uh, particularly those uh, either in the ADD, ADHD, or autism spectrum. of it's just, It can be a thing, and it can be really nice when you find somebody. You don't have that pressure. So our friends are not enjoying or enjoying not making eye contact. And uh, so what's with the blocks? And is this block tape? And we'll we go to the next page, I suppose. And uh, yes, I've decided to blockify my life, or at least as much of it as it makes sense to, which is, this is describing me again i've tried this to some degree it's not in here but in my workshop it's a lot of blockification and it's, it's it's i'm coming along with it this is a bit of a fantasy of where i could take it i think i find i operate best if i have a diverse pool of materials to work with i.e junk that way i can just follow my creative instincts and put a bunch of stuff together to solve just about any problem that comes my way so I figured if I make as much in my life as possible, be connectable via a shared organizational system, that will streamline my workflow and grant me more ready opportunities to combine objects to solve puzzles. For instance, flashlight plus block plus hot glue gun plus block equals, you can now you can hot glue uh, uh, in the dark. You're welcome. Artemis and Sapphire's camera and mic rigs for their video streaming setups. Uh, artists and, and and Sapphire were the characters in the previous chapter alongside our uh, character here who hasn't introduced um, uh, I think she they uh, they all say they some themselves yet and that's there's a point of that we haven't been introduced these characters names because I think that's how it often goes but we have met Artemis and Sapphire by name 
And uh, so you have to read the other chapter to know more about them, but you put your cameras anywhere. I lose things a lot and it's really handy for me to be able to stick things in place so I can find them easily. I haven't implemented again the, the block key holders, but I want to, I think it's a great idea. You are so cool. You're like MacGyver. I also haven't implemented the universal extendo tool system, but I think that's, it should work in theory. <laughs> well, I call it the point and click lifestyle based off those old puzzle solving PC games, which again, this is, uh, I think, oh, how I try to live. I like having lots of junk around, like my dollar store kit bass show. I want to connect various things and just have something on hand. You never know what's going to be useful and what's not, which again is kind of the point of this chapter because when it comes to people, you never know is very loaded to say useful, but you never know what it is about a person that's going to help. So we, it's to our benefit to have diversity, to have lots of people around different types of people. You can all interact and figure out how they can fit together and what you can make something new you never thought of before. And I think we get into that in a more literal way later in this chapter. So I guess we can switch to the next page before I talk to at too much length. And I, I'm guessing I'm not going to get through all the pages we have settled here. So if we're at my time, you can just tell me and we'll. Oh, we still have a bit of time. We started late, right? So let's let's say two fifty. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, I just you know I I know we I think we put all my pages of this chapter in the the event, but like if we don't get through them, we don't get through them, and that's all fine. good. No worries. Um, but uh, well, you certainly do a lot. Yep putting that aerospace engineering degree to work say what yeah back in the before times i did what so many aerospace engineers have to do in the u.s and then i worked for the military of course when i reached my breaking point and had to come out as trans i also found that i couldn't stomach building planes that bomb people either funny that so i struck out on my own and started working for myself and never looked back and that is also based on multiple true stories I've heard from people. Like I've talked to multiple airspace engineers and people in similar degrees are just like, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't take the business of whatever it was because having found my or more authentic self, I didn't want to do this thing that wasn't authentic to me, essentially. And so I wanted to put a little nod to that in there. And again, it's this changing over time thing. Really, you'd think with your degree and know-how, there'd be some kind of high-paying job you can get that doesn't involve working for the military. It wasn't just working for the military. It was working in a structure that restricted me. We can go to the next right away, though. It's okay. Society in the working world isn't set up for your or my personal well-being, especially if you are neurodivergent. Society brands neurodivergent people as a burden or as unable to function, like your doctor and their high-functioning label. But really, if society weren't structured around catering to neurotypical experience of things, then most Audis and other neurodivergent folks would be able to function in our own way just fine. Like an adorable betta fish, I find I do much better in an environment fine-tuned to my needs, and I've decided that I want to prioritize that in my life and in my career. And I think before I'll move to the next panel, yeah, like I, I think a lot about uh, what is serving you. I, on my last uh, episode of Sunday Portrait, I was talking with Nicholas Sperling, uh, and she was talking about living the life she wanted to live. And it's a matter of like prioritizing, okay, maybe we're in an imperfect structure. Maybe the world isn't set up for me. And there's certain things I can do maybe to change that. Maybe we can work together for social change. But there's certain things that at least right now I can't change. How am I going to live the life I want to live within that? And creating a structure for yourself that works for you. And I think a lot of people are kind of forced to do that in a way more than others are, especially if, say, you're not normal. You have to find some way to be yourself in a world that isn't, if, if they're not out to stop you, at the very least, it's not driving you towards it. They're not facilitating it. You're going to have to facilitate it yourself. And we all have to do this to varying degrees. And I think it's an important thing to prioritize in oneself and one's life and one's work of like, okay, but is this what's working for me? And in not necessarily a selfish way, but in a thriving, surviving, taking care of your own needs sort of way. Uh, so what are you saying? That Audis should secede from society? Oh, no. I think society needs people like us. And we can go to next. As a species, we thrive on coming up with new ideas to solve our problems. It's how we've managed to move into every biome across the globe and, and deplete its resources at a catastrophic rate that we have. 
It would be advantageous to an idea-centered species to have a certain percentage of its population approach life from a different perspective from the norm. To always have people around so you see things differently, uh, guys, who experience their bodies differently, who experience their gender differently, or who experience sound or sight differently, or whose brains just think differently. This diversity of peoples and their experiences will inevitably pay off somehow for society. Uh, is what I, I actually can't read the final line, but I'm pretty sure that's what I wrote, something to that degree. I don't know if you all can see it better than me, uh, but that's what I was talking about a little earlier of like, it, just having a wide variety of people in the world allows us to approach problems differently. We can get different perspectives and not everything pays off in every single, single situation, but eventually it does pay off. And I, I found that with collecting junk, uh, things that like toys and old parts of technology it doesn't work anymore as long as i have a good place to put it and store it and find it again when i need it eventually i will use it for something and often that something will be more amazing than i thought of or would have thought of on my own if i didn't have this thing there and so often i would throw something out and be like oh i needed that six months later or something and, you know i don't want to be a hoarder or you know take it to extremes you have to be honest with yourself about what it is you could use within your own means but usually if you can keep something i if i can keep something i know i can use it eventually and i feel people that's why we have such diversity i think it's hardwired into us as a species to have different types of ways of being in the world different ways of seeing and experiencing things different things come in different ways like a person might be in a wheelchair for many different reasons and to say oh you're in that for a reason and it's a good thing is not something i would be into doing but it's in order for us to view ourselves as as uh, having a, a place in the world it helps to think about the ways we're approaching life and how that makes us different from other people and how that difference might help somebody else it's i find for myself being a really empowering way to think about who I am and the life that I've lived. Uh, we can go to the next one. And if we think of this in terms of the survival and evolution of a species, anytime the ideas or influence of even just the conf conferring presence of a, an individual leads to an increased survival rate for their kin group, copies of the same genes that made that divergent individual who they were will be passed on to the next generation via their kin, even if that person has no children of their own. Our species is hardwired to make some of us different because having us around inevitably pays off. And yeah, I'm, this is a chart. I feel like I've seen some version of this in a book somewhere, but I couldn't find it. So I had to replicate it in this very simplified form and it's oversimplified. And I wanted to include an important note. Uh, DNA is not everything and being useful does not determine a person's right to exist. But I can see a very clear mechanism by which it's just... No, on any level, we're not even talking about human culture and ideas, the way we choose to treat one another or about how we think of a society and how it should be structured. Just on a clearly, the, the biological facts of how our bodies work, it, it's useful to have people that are a little different on any level, any possible level is useful. And I can see how that could be preserved within a population. And this individual who's very science-minded, I thought, oh, they'd definitely be on board that sort of thing. They'd be interested in that. So we'll have them use talk about that here. And it doesn't have to be the end-all be-all sort of thing, but here you go. Here's a basic model of how feasibly it could be innate to human beings to be different and how that's a good thing for us. And some people feel comfort, I think, from that kind of concrete example. and. That's what I wanted to do with uh, this book was provide various approaches to thinking about things that might appeal to different people and, and less to others. I know some people, as these characters definitely talk a little bit about later in the chapter, if we get there, about being uncomfortable with such scientific explanations for things or looking for such scientific explanations for things because sometimes that's not coming from a good place or sometimes it leads somewhere we didn't intend it to go. And it's important to be really... I guess remembering the human beings at the center of everything you do uh, is this providing people with safety and dignity and uh, allowing them to thrive. That should be first and foremost in how we think about uh, ourselves and our world, I think. Um, uh, we as a society need to uplift all of our members, not just to the ones it is convenient to. 
not only because it is the moral thing to do, but also because it is only then that we as a species can be our best and strongest human selves. And again, note, please do not literally lift people unless they ask you to. I, I, this, I was drawing this and I remembered seeing people talk about how they dislike these kinds of, of imagery and metaphor. And I was like, oh yeah, but how else can I talk about uplift? It was hard to come up with something better. And I eventually just like, well, I'll do it. And then I have to include a little joke with that because I don't want it to be condescending. Maybe a person doesn't want to be lifted up. Uh, in a literal sense, but they do want to be uplifted by society. There's a lot of like, I'm trying to represent a lot here and very, I was very fearful of like, am I going to get this wrong? Please, I don't want to insult anybody. And and I consulted with many as many people as I could and eventually had to be like, well, okay, I'm going to put myself out here and be vulnerable. And uh, a lot of this book was about vulnerability. So it felt appropriate, I guess, in that sense. But every single time I'm talking about a community that I'm not directly related to, I have to be like, oh, but I have, I, I'm not part of that community, just so you know. So don't take my word for it 100%. I'm just trying my best based on what I've heard. And if you tell someone tells you differently, well, listen to them if they're from that community and I'm not. <laughs> um, but these sorts of ideas had me feeling the way this character is in the final panel of I'm feeling so much Audi and trans pride I didn't know I had and you get sometimes you meet those individuals that really inspire you and I've, I've been very privileged to talk to people that just like it's like yeah you know what actually I think of myself in a whole new way and I'm I feel a lot better about myself and these labels that maybe have been applied to me that I feel shame for or uh, just confused by no this person's owning it and you know, they're just such a wonderful example. How could I not feel good being in some way like them, you know, if they're the same label as me, say? Um, we can go to the next page, I suppose. Besides, we get too caught up in thinking of education as ending in a specific career. I didn't know it at the time, but I didn't get my aerospace engineering degree in order to become an aerospace engineer. I got that degree in order to learn skills that I can then apply to learn other skills so I can branch out and, in, and thrive in whatever way I decide suits me best. The skills I learn can be applied to anything else I decide to do in my life. As I like to say, every single thing you do makes you better at every single thing you do. And I, I do say that. That's the thing I just like to say, but I... I had to put it in there because I think it's very much true. You can do lots of different things in your life. And that will, as they say in art school, back when I was at Emily Carr, it informs your practice. You took some pottery course that will make you a better cartoonist somehow. If you, you know, pay attention to it, you can think about the principles behind it and maybe it'll be 10, 20 years down the road. And you'll be like, you know what, back in that pottery course, I learned about this obscure thing. And that principle actually applies to the shape I'm creating in this drawing, you know, like it's, you never know what's going to pay off. And, you know, I'm actually finding myself right now doing a whole lot more video work than in comics, but all the years I spent doing comics and everything I did at art school studying to do comics, it still applies and it's very useful. And that whole uh, experience I've got going on uh, will keep on teaching me more and more. I, I've done martial arts for over 20 years now, and it's informed every single thing I do. It, it affects how I approach things. And I, I worked as a tree planter for years, putting myself through university, and that was informed by martial arts. But also in tree planting, I applied those principles to every job I've ever had and everything I do. And it just builds on itself. So if you go to school, you could get a high profile degree and you might find out, you know what, actually I don't want the job that comes with that degree, but it doesn't mean that degree was pointless. It was actually very useful. I was just learning about life through the lens of say an aerospace engineering degree maybe a very expensive way to learn some of these lessons, but it's a high profile kind of learning you receive. And you can definitely apply that to just about anything you decide to apply it to. And I, I hope people remember that because a lot of people I think are very frustrated right now with having gone to school and not being able to use their degrees. I think it's a common thing. And I see people repurpose their education in ways you wouldn't expect and it's really spectacular. And we can do that with every aspect of our lives. You can do that with any object. You can repurpose an object just like you can repurpose your experiences and you can repurpose yourself to a new purpose in life. It, it's always changing. It's, you don't have to limit yourself just because you did something in the past. Uh, learning is a good unto itself because it teaches us methods to uncover what makes us happy. Income isn't everything. 
I am prioritizing in my own life, my own freedom, creativity, and happiness, and that of my partners. And she grabs it. I need to block if I something, babe. And this is, she's passing it on to her, her partners there. Um, and uh, they get to uh, share in, in her richness. Everything that she's learned in her life is also passed on to the other people in her life. And it grows beyond yourself. Um, which is in one of the previous pages, there's a little thing that said memes over genes. I believe that, you know, the, the old way evolution. I'm a big biology nut from back when I was a teenager. And, uh, you know, evolution working on genetics and all that stuff. That's the way things were for a long time. But I think humans, we got a faster way. We talk to each other and we write stuff down. We write books and we do presentations over Zoom. And we spread our information at a level interpersonally uh, that's so much faster than DNA. DNA is such a slow way to bring information from one generation to the next. And it changes only by random chance and then is filtered through natural selection based on the environment the animal's living in. Humans can go into that environment and just, you know, we adapt to it in a generation, learn how to make tools, effectively changing our bodies, extending our bodies. And then that's why we live everywhere, right? And so... It's kind of, I think, the way we have to think of just being able to pass on information that way. I, you know, like if you can't have children, say I can't have children. And, but I think of my comics and my art a little bit as my children and all the people that I affect through my work. That's another kind of information, another piece of yourself being passed on that in some ways is extremely powerful, maybe even more powerful than, you know, creating a life is something, you know, completely different. But, you're making one life, which who knows what else they'll touch. But if you're touching many, many, many lives all at once, that's also a very powerful thing. And we shouldn't undersell that. Uh, we can move to the next, I suppose. Uh, direct action and activism, of course, important pieces of a greater whole if we want to enact change and improve society. Uh, I'm going to make a personal special note right here. Uh, people in this parade here are uh, some people who support me on Patreon at a certain amount. And thank you so much, y'all. You're the best. And the people who support me on Patreon are why I'm able to survive. I don't mean to make this about that, but that's their panel. That's their spot. And I made sure to include that. And thanks again, y'all. It's you're wonderful. Uh, but they're not always for everybody. Sometimes living your best life openly as yourself and visibly thriving as a member of your community can also be another way to help it as a sort of beacon of hope and inspiration for others like ourselves. It's like a once an athletic world record is broken. Often many athletes subsequently go on to match said record afterwards. Whoa, they're fast. I bet I could do that. Because once they saw that it could be done, they were able to push themselves to do what they used to think was impossible. If, I see, if people see someone like themselves, people like you, people like me, autistic people, trans and queer people, people of color, if people see someone like themselves being happy, then happiness becomes proven to be a possibility for people like themselves. Could I do that? So that's why I'm always fully open and fully proud of every part of who I am. Oh, I can't actually see what they're saying in the bottom panel. I've forgotten, but it's definitely something like, wow, that's great. Oh, no, they say teach me senpai. That's right. That is what they say. Oh. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I really do believe this. And I see it every time I see, uh, say, a queer person out walking with their pride flag pin with their with their flying the flag out front. It's just it. I, I see them and it, it makes me sort of see what could be possible for me. There's been times where I've been very depressed and I'll see a person with a trans flag out and I just kind of see them maybe being happy. And it's like, Oh, yeah, you know, like maybe I'm brooding over my past, lamenting the years that I spent in the closet or something. And well, here's a person not too dissimilar from myself who's living and loving life and just being themselves. And it, if they can do it, I can do it, too. And I, you know, I used to work out a lot, actually. I, I was actually really muscular. I was in bodybuilding and powerlifting and stuff. And I work out with some really strong people. And you're always, it's to your benefit to work out with somebody who's stronger than you because they will show you what's possible. And I would work out with these guys that were stronger than me. And in a very short amount of time, I'd be able to do what they could do or more because I was sort of driven to it. I was working out with them, doing harder workouts. And it was just even a matter of, I didn't think that was possible before. I was amazed the first time I saw somebody lift the whole stack of weight on a machine and I thought, you could do that? And then I watched them. How did they do that? 
you know, and follow their technique perhaps. And maybe if I'm working out with them, I can do their same workouts. And now I'm learning and growing in a way that I couldn't have grown because I didn't even think that was a thing that I could have done necessarily. And it happens in so many ways uh, all throughout life. And uh, I know I'm, I know again, I'm very privileged to get to talk to and be around some wonderful and amazing inspiring people because that's how you grow and thrive is by surrounding yourself with other people that are growing too and you grow together um i suppose we can move on i mean even just the fact that coming out as trans was made so much harder by the stigma put on me by people's beliefs about autistic people makes me link those two parts of my identity I also yeah. feel this way about having ADHD. I wasn't diagnosed until later in life because people have assumptions about masculine presentations of ADHD symptoms. And since they saw me as a boy, they didn't read my behavior as ADHD, despite my behavior being in line with how ADHD often presents in girls. I think of the explanation what they got. Oh yeah, uh, by the way, my pronouns are they and them. Oh, thanks, either she or they is fine for me. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. My name is Ty. Yeah. And this is Roger. Uh, it's going back to they didn't introduce themselves because I'm like this. A lot of my friends are like this. You get so caught up talking to somebody that you're connecting with. You just don't introduce yourselves at all. And uh, I actually, I find often I don't introduce my characters and my stories in general because I'm just like, let's get to the story. And then I'm like, oh, right. But also these are the people, by the way. And so it was a little bit like I... I, I like how I see that part of myself playing out in my stories anyways, but also it's how I think a lot of us are, especially when we're excited and passionate in a conversation and, and the ADHD thing. That's my experience too. Like I, I've talked to so many, uh, uh, especially trans women who just like w weren't diagnosed with ADHD because they're looking for how a boy would have ADHD. And it's not to say that boys and girls is gender essentialist kind of thing, but typically in society, we see these sorts of things play out differently based on how boys and girls are treated and, and the expectations we have of them. And so I wasn't acting the way they expect a boy with ADHD to act. And so I never got diagnosed with that until I was into my thirties. And a lot of women, both cis and trans have similar issues because of the way we're, we're expecting to see something and we don't see it. And uh, that's why, yeah, engaging with different parts of oneself and the language we use to describe people, I think, again, it shifts how we see things hopefully for the better. Uh, we can move on, I suppose. Okay. I'm Molly. You're probably going to have to tell me your name again at some point. Uh, I never forget a face, but I almost always forget names the first time around. I'm honestly the same way. And again, I'm honestly the same way. And a lot of my friends are. It's terrible. I feel bad, but I'm learning to forgive myself for it while also trying to do better with it because that's kind of all we can do. You know, going back to what you just said, I've read about those turfs, turds who say things like being trans is caused by being autistic or the trans lobby is preying upon autistics and recruiting us or some nonsense. And like, I know it's all just hot garbage and isn't based in reality, but as someone who has been out as queer all their life and is now going through this autism assessment process later in life, hearing these sorts of things really undermines my confidence at times. I feel ashamed of myself for doubting it even for a moment. And that's something I've, uh, like, it's just kind of this gaslighting that's being going on. I don't want to get too much into bigotry and such, because I think that takes up too much space in these conversations. And I don't want my whole life to be about that, certainly. But it's this, this sort of not valuing autistic people and trans people's own reported experiences of our lives that you see implied in so many things, especially when they say things like, oh, those, those transgenders are tricking autistic people into being trans. It's like it profoundly insulting to autistic people or profoundly insulting when people insinuate that, uh, say, peer pressure is tricking trans people into coming out as trans. Like, can you just take us seriously at our word? Like we're human beings or but it just belies though these people kind of don't at times. And it's a common experience, again, that my friends have reported as well as I found in myself, which is, I think a big part of why I've done a lot of the work I have is to reframe the conversation and not that way. Um, I think we talk probably about that reframing in the next page or two. I would simply say that Audie's lack of regard for arbitrary social norms causes us to be more likely to choose to come out rather than suppress ourselves for some of other people's comfort, or for the sake of other people's comfort. 
more of us seem trans because we're not afraid to be ourselves. For every Audi out of the closet, I'm sure there's a neurotypical who's still in there. You are a boy. Well, nope. Yes, sir. I didn't know how else to really depict that for the most part in an empowering way, certainly, at least for the people who are able to resist. But I don't know. I wanted to have the happy ending there. So I think I went with this fruitful illustration. Though Audis in our generation mostly had to adopt social norms just to stay safe, which I was something I made sure to add. This, this particular explanation is one you know, I don't think there's a definitive explanation for any of these things, but I'd, I'd heard, you know, maybe a couple of people say it and I thought, yeah, that does make a great deal of sense. The people I know who are, are very out and proud about who they are in terms of being autistic and trans, they've often been out about their gender nonconformity in one way or another and able to hide it in one way or another because they're being who they are. Um, and uh, uh, everybody's a little different. It's a spectrum after all, right? But I felt that was something that I'd seen quite a bit and was also a very empowering way of looking at it, certainly. So it made sense to me that this character would see it that way too. But the, the second part, that was something a friend of mine who I showed this part to, uh, I was a disick, said, yeah, but also uh, I know myself and others had to hide a lot of it too. You know, in our generation, these people are roughly my age, early 30s. And um, a lot of us did have to hide, even if we weren't so great at it, because we weren't concerned about other people's comfort. Well, a lot of us were made to be concerned. We had no choice about it. Um, but uh, just like how it seems there is this huge spike in transgender kids, but really it's just that kids now feel safer to come out as trans in a way that they didn't feel safe 10 years ago. And that's also true. People always talk about, oh, you know, this epidemic of trans kids coming out. It's like, you can look at the graphs, go look at the... Uh, um, left-handedness graft from when they stopped uh, punishing kids for being left-handed, it goes way up. It's exactly the same thing. It's like, if you stop policing it in children, you'll see them being comfortable expressing themselves. And that's why we see it today. And that's good. That's to the benefit of everybody. Um, we'll go to the next one. Totally. Same with the seeming sudden emergence of non-binary genders. It wasn't that people are inventing new genders. Uh, I know. I'll ostracize myself from society by pretending to be a new gender I just made up for no reason. It was a language for descri describing our experience of gender outside of the male-female binary didn't exist in the West until the people experiencing those genders had found a position in society of relative safety and stability and could therefore develop names of their own for their experiences. Uh, there are only boy and girl. Hmm, feels wrong, but I guess I'll just take your word for it. Meanwhile, countless other cultures have had language describing gender outside of the male-female binary for thousands of years. And that's true. It's uh, pretty much every society across history you'll find somewhere within it, if it wasn't you know, pushed out by a later force, had some way of talking about gender that isn't this hard male-female, unchanging, immutable, no room for expression outside of that idea, what you're born as is what you are. That's not the norm. And I did not list all of them. There's no way I could, but I tried to have a fairly comprehensive list of uh, various examples. And uh, I can't speak on the specifics of any of those examples because I don't experience that, but that is a thing that exists and it's far from a new thing. It, as long as there's been humans, there's been variation within how humans relate to gender. Um, we can go to the next one. I think we're actually going to stop here yeah, that's for great. because, wow, there was so much there. Thank you so much. But but you both have questions waiting for you. So I wanted to make sure that everybody has a chance to, uh, to ask you some questions. So I'm going to start off with um, Sean's question. And this one, I think, is for PJ. Yes. Um, Sean would like to know, PJ, if you're still in contact with your parents. Oh. Did I lose y'all? Oh, I'm not sure if we lost PJ. I, I saw there's a bit of a lag in the video I see for you and I'm also not hearing PJ. So perhaps it's some kind of strange connection thing, but. Oh no. Oh, did I, okay. Oh, Can there you are. You <laughs> Maybe you I were muted. I muted myself so I wasn't interrupting during Sabrina. Um, yeah, no, my parents and I were good. I mean, my dad passed away a couple of years ago, but 
these events took place when I was 25 and I'm 43 now. And uh, no, like they were, I just, uh, I pushed myself away from them while I was homeless because I didn't, you know, I didn't want my mom to see it. And uh, my dad was living overseas at the time, but yeah, no, we're good. I mean, yeah, my dad, as soon as I was ready to get my act together, my dad like stepped up to help me out and we were good friends until he passed away. And then my mom and I chat like at least, my mom's in California, but we chat all the time. So yeah, we're good, we're good. <laughs> I always have to tell people like I'm doing great now. This book doesn't reflect how I'm doing now. <laughs> For sure, for sure. And um, I have a question, actually, this kind of overlaps um, for both of you. Uh, both of you were asked a version of this question by Sheila. Uh, basically, she wanted to know, she teaches in a grade eight classroom, and she wants to know if your respective pieces of work are appropriate for students in her, in her classroom. Uh, mine certainly was made to be appropriate for that. The, the publisher that I uh, put it through uh, Singing Dragon uh, under Jessica Kingsley Publishing House. That's sort of what they specialize in is it's like kind of all ages, uh, especially I think like grade eight is an excellent age for it, I'd say. And information comics that are not specifically meant, they're not just educational, but they definitely are imparting this kind of knowledge. It's That's kind of what it was made for, really. <laughs> yeah, for me, um. I think there's only like one F-bomb in the whole book. So I would say that's the only warning I have for it. Other than that, it's, uh, I mean, it's a heavy book by nature, but it's not explicit, I don't think, in any way. Um, yeah, there's there's one swear word in the whole book. So other than that, I think it's fine. Mm. <laughs> I okay, see the comments street cred. authentic. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think junior high school kids or I think it's called middle school here. So I think like seventh to eighth grade and up could read it. I know when my friend's kids read it and uh, they were fine. They were like grade five, grade six, you know, like I said, besides the one F-bomb, that's it. Cool. Awesome. Um, so just a reminder to anybody who is unaware, you can drop your questions in the chat. We had a couple lined up for Sabrina and PJ. So I just wanted to make sure that you are aware it's a little bubble talk situation going on down there. Um, one question I wanted to jump in with, uh, for both of you, why did you choose graphic novels as the medium to share these stories? Mm. Um, do you want to go first, Sabrina, or? Uh, I can if you want. Yeah, sure. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, well, I've been, you know, I've been drawing comics for, like, oof, over, I mean, a long time, really, though. I drew comics when I was a little kid, and then I kind of stopped for high school, and at the end of high school, I decided to go into making comics mainly because I just realized I like telling stories all the pictures I always drew as a kid were very narrative oriented and so I just decided I wanted to combine my love of drawing with you know telling these interesting stories that I kind of was always coming up with all the time as a kid and I have done all sorts of different kinds of comics over the years and first year out the, the book I mentioned earlier was this more the first attempt at a more like I guess like information type comic where I was like talking about this issue or this this experience and that was an opportunity that arose uh, because the publisher was looking for somebody to do that I thought oh yeah that would be a great idea to I was, I was going through transition myself I just kind of come off my first year uh, I think I started writing it maybe my second or third year and just kind of reflecting on that time and it's a very tumultuous time and so I thought yeah I'll make this storytelling format that I've been using so far in various ways to apply to this because I can get this imagery across of, you know, like uh, the juxtaposition, say, of text and image of like, you know, we can have one thing and then impart another piece of meaning to it. Uh, I felt very appropriate for these tumultuous feelings that come along with, uh, you know, wh what I'm writing about. And so when I wrote the sequel, of course, I'm going to make it a graphic novel again. And that was a great way I, uh, to work out this idea I'd actually had for a while, which was the Baton Pass comic, which is where we have a story about one character, a set of characters. And then at a certain point, they pass the baton to the next character. Perhaps they talk to that character in their chapter, maybe not. And then they pass it on to the next character and they have a story. And then they pass that to another character who has a story. And in my case, it becomes five stories that are kind of loosely connected across this social circle and eventually kind of all comes together at the end in the epilogue. And uh, 
it kind of worked out. It was a bit of an experiment. Like I, you know, I like try to do one new thing every day. Well, I, when I make a work, I want to be trying something new. And that was kind of the new, I just read a few new things in this book, but the baton pass is definitely me trying something out and I think it worked okay. Yeah, uh, for me, the graphic novel format that's used in this, like there's no dialogue boxes and stuff. Um, it's based off my journals, actually. So if you're to look at any of my personal journals, you would find it reads very much like Tower 25 does. Um, and that's really influenced by my, um, my grandmother and grandfather in Japan. My grandmother was an artist and my grandfather was a haiku poet. And so there's an art form called haiga where they'll have like an image then like a haiku written next to it. And I have a collection of these that my grandparents made. And um, I grew up around that artwork. And so it really influences what I do and influenced my journals, which in turn influenced uh, this graphic novel project, which starts off as a journal originally. And the, um, yeah, I just, I like the way like Sabrina was just saying too. I like how words and images combine kind of create something new. And yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I just, I, I like it because you can just tell more than you can with either one by itself. And yeah, so it's just, so yeah, it's really how I draw my journals. I do have comics with panels and stuff and that'll be come out when the Toshme project book comes out. And then I also am illustrating someone, a book of someone's poetry and I'll have a very similar layout to the Tower 25 book. So yeah. Very cool. Um, and actually, Sean O'Brien had a question that was actually next on my list uh, for both of you. Is there any advice that you can give anybody who wants to get into comics and get their work out there? Mm. Um, um, I definitely say show your work to people. Don't be afraid to do that. That's always my first and foremost thing. If you're, especially if you're like still figuring out your art style uh, or you're not sure how to draw a particular thing like don't be afraid to ask people like I, that's one of my biggest struggles is being afraid to just like talk to people and like you know you maybe don't go bugging you know a person you have no you ever really talked to the vacation you know critique my portfolio or whatever but you know post your work and engage with other creators online, say, and talk to them and see what they're doing. And then eventually you'll you'll start to kind of find what they're doing that is maybe working for them. And then they can maybe give you feedback on what you're doing. And you'll, you'll grow more that way. As where if you sit on your work and you're just working alone secretly, you're not getting that live engagement that'll teach you on what you need to do with what you're doing. And, and then, of course, when you show your work, that's how, say, an industry person might see it or, or uh, you know, somebody that could help you make it happen on the level you're hoping to, whether it's publishing it as a book or, I don't know, an online uh, publication. If you're just looking for somebody that could make it, you know, happen, you're only going to find them if you put it out there. Yeah, I will echo what Sabrina's saying on that line. And there's groups out there. Um, I'll give a shout out to my publisher, uh, Cloudscape Comics in Vancouver because they have like a whole like membership thing and they have uh, comic workshops sometimes for kids and all ages and they have well with COVID I'm not sure how they're pulling it off they used to have like meetings a few times a month where people could just come there and like just hang out and draw comics like in a group setting mm -hmm. I'm not sure how they're doing that now but you know there's there are places that are offering those types of things I think those things are really useful like to like to have your work be seen by other people like Sabrina was saying and yeah I mean don't you know don't be afraid I have found that like the comics community is the indie comics community is pretty accepting and pretty helpful you know Sabrina gave me my first interview for you some years ago now that was 2017 and, yeah yeah and I was just starting out as like a web comic person on Twitter oh 16 golly yeah yeah so, and now like Sabrina and I, I consider Sabrina like one of my good friends here. So, you know, it's nice. You like, you just never know who you'll meet by sharing your work. So definitely don't be afraid. Totally. Great advice. Thank you both. Uh, question from Sheila um, for Sabrina. Would you ever speak to GSA students about your life and knowledge? Yes, absolutely. I, I've 
often don't get many opportunities these days. I mean, even you know, with COVID and all that, but I always talk to anybody, uh, especially uh, youth about these things because it's important we put that out there. So sure. Definitely, yeah, contact me, Sheila. Hopefully Sheila will uh, be able to follow you on Twitter or reach out that way. And yeah. she will do so. Thank you. So uh, there we go. Awesome. Yay. Um, PJ I was curious to know, you talked a little bit about um, journals and, and yes. how they were important to tower for tower 25. I think if I'm, I think I'm correct in saying Sabrina, you chose to use a kind of font, right? Like that's not handwritten. Yeah, that's that. Well, that is a font of my handwriting at some point. Is oh! that, that's like, that font is over 10 years old now, maybe 11 or 12 now. I did that for my first graphic novel that I self-published, uh, okay. Time Tourists. And that was just, I tried to make a very natural font of just my kind of messy writing that would match wow. my art. And it, I've tried a few attempts to update it, but I always go back to that one in the end. I like it better. So my question to both of you is, is how important is it to use your own writing as opposed to an actual font um, to make it part of the storytelling process? Uh, for me, for this book, um, I had, this whole book was basically written and illustrated in a two month time period. And I freehanded the whole thing. Like there's no pencils or anything. I just did put pen to paper. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty organic and I just wrote as I was going along. So there's no fonts. The downside of that was when I took it to the editors and I had to go back and like just rewrite whole sections, you know, cause it was pretty sloppy and a lot of it was unreadable. But I think, you know, hand like Sabrina's font is built to offer own handwriting, which makes sense to me. And I think that the fonts definitely play like, or handwriting or script definitely plays like an important part of communicating like your style or your story. Like if I used a typewriter font for this book, I don't think it would have worked as well because it would have taken, the book's meant to read like a conversation and I feel that the writing carries that. So yeah, that's, that's my two cents on that. Oh yeah, the wrong font can take you completely out of a story. You'll see like, like you don't see it so much now because it's a bigger business, but back when like manga translations were like really rare uh yeah. <laughs> you get these these translations with just like very off-putting font that just you know there's like maybe it's got serifs it looks like times new roman or something in a comic and it's just like you know oh, I don't, what am i reading a good word document here or a comic it doesn't work so it really yeah. matters the text that you use and yeah i i wanted to use as i said a font that was like my handwriting because it would look like my art and then it's yeah. very seamless, but because it's a font, you can just type it out, best of both worlds kind of thing. For yeah. sure, for sure. I just saw Sean comment here. I never know what font to use. It suits my drawing either. I just use Comic Sans. I don't oh. know if you can relate to that. <laughs> uh, Comic Sans, I don't know why people are so down on Comic Sans. I don't find it grading as many people do, but like, uh, you know, it's loose, it's soft and like, I mean, I'm sure people are gonna be like, what do you mean you could do worse? But I feel like you could do worse for comics. I feel like you could- I, do I agree with that. Roman, like, you know, no, yeah. it's, it's no serifs at least. It's just very natural. Yeah, comic stands for your like term paper, maybe not a great idea. <laughs> comic stands for your comic book itself. Like, I why not? And there's, I heard yeah. that if you're writing something like a term paper or anything that you're writing, it's good to use Comic Sans. It comes out more easily because it's like, you don't take it seriously. It's just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, just tell you about a fun cartoon thing here. It doesn't matter. And and so apparently that's a writing trick people use. That makes yeah. sense. I know there's one graphic novel that I really like called um, Asterios Polyp by David Masicelli, who did like a lot of Batman work. We did this one graphic novel and every character's voice is in a different font. Oh yeah. And each font really just like echoes and each each writing style's character is like really developed for each character and I've only seen that done in that one book and to me that was really clever and just really beautiful I don't know if, if you've read that book before Sabrina or I don't think I've read that particular one but I can think of a few comics that have done something similar yeah 
uh like speech bubbles being different too like you yeah get, that's like, another a, one like a yeah. spooky speech bubble for some evil emperor or ghost or monster or you know and then like a you know normal round one for our our heroes or whatever you know uh, it's a good way to convey meaning through these design elements I love that. That's so creative. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I don't see one in the queue. So I wanted to know who inspires you. This is for both of you. Who inspires you to put this work out there and share it with us? Um, for me, oh man, that's like such an emo question for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know it's okay. It's all good. I created this book originally as like a couple journal entries. And then my wife, uh, Eden Feinde, who's also an artist and musician, she encouraged me to keep uh, pursuing, to keep working on it. And so the book came out of like a couple private journal entries. And ultimately, in my naive, idealistic world, I put it out there hoping that it would either like comfort other people like myself um, who've recovered from the stings. Or would hope, hopefully help people know they're not alone if you're going through those things. Or to help like people develop empathy for even not necessarily someone they know going through that situation. Or just a stranger on the street. Like my whole goal is to kind of hopefully bring about a little bit of humanity, I guess, with it. And, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, I mean, I guess that's why I did it. I'm hoping in my own little world to like, Put that book out there to make a difference um you know and i've gotten feedback and it's done that and it's just you know it's just a personal story that i hope can help maybe prevent some kids from going off the deep end i don't know if it would or not but i'd be like so super psyched to get this book into like juvenile hall for instance or foster care kids that would be like that would be epic and I'm actually part of a panel for the Toronto Comics Art Festival next month. Cool. That's specializing directly with um, substance abuse and everything and comics. And they're having me work with, uh, I can't remember the name of the group, but they're actually having me on a panel with the LGBTQ Two Spirit panelists to talk about drug addiction and comics and outreach. So that should be pretty interesting. That's next month at the Toronto Comics Arts Festival. Awesome. So yeah, so there's my answer. Sabrina? Uh, well, it's a combination of the my community. Like I have so many wonderful queer and trans friends. I've, I've got an online community of, it's not just trans women, but it's very much geared towards trans women who are uh, varying stages of coming out or transitioning or living them as themselves. And we've got a lot of them there who are maybe just starting out, some in their first year out, say. And it's a very difficult time and they need support. And so I'm very thankful that, I don't know, I feel like I, I'm very lucky that I get to do that, to be honest, because you're shaping somebody, you're helping them grow, and it's a very important job. You're, you know, co co colloquially referred to at times as like trans mom or trans sister, because it's, it's a family in some ways. And that community is what helps me, I don't know, remember the value that my own life has. It's, there's some painful sides to maybe coming out. And that sort of leads to the second person that it's for, which is actually my past self, as there's a very emotional topic. But the more I can give the years that I didn't really live as myself, value it helps me feel more whole and so it's this symbiosis of of our own self and community that makes me realize it's important to keep making this kind of work that fosters and nourishes your one's own community because in turn it will nourish yourself and your place in the world Amazing. Well, I wanted to take the time to thank you both for joining me and for your thank insights you. and thank for going you. through the work. Um, just what a joy and what a treat. And um, folks, if you haven't had a chance to read these books, please go out and buy them. Local authors, incredible work. I've been so lucky to read them both and love them both. Um, so thank you so much once again to the uh, Arts Council of New Westminster for putting this together. Yeah. Sabrina, DJ, you are awesome. Thank you, thank oh, you for thank having you. us. Yeah, that's great. Awesome, awesome. So if you haven't had a chance to follow these two on Instagram or Twitter, please do so. And uh, once again, my name is Ria Renouf and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon.
Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.